Good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment, EBSCO, and Index Data. My name is Paul Moeller. I am the Director of Metadata Services at the University of Colorado Boulder and the host for today's event. Our program for today features updates on Folio user experience design and accessibility. Today's session, like all Folio Forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Libra Library Foundation's YouTube channel and to resources session of folio.org. As an open forum, participants can see participants' names and all questions submitted. And we have muted everyone except the speakers to ensure good sound quality. We value your participation and encourage you to engage in the topic. Use the question box within Zoom to enter questions and comments as they come to you. The speakers will address the questions at the end of the presentation. If you'd like to tweet, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum. We also encourage you to continue the conversation on this topic on the Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org. Our speakers today are Philip Jacobson, founder of Samhung and the lead user experience designer of Folio, and Beth German, the convener of the Folio Accessibility SIG and the service design librarian at Texas A&M University. And if you're ready, Beth, I'll just turn it over to you. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so let me share my screen um, and get everything in the right spot. Share. Okay, and so hopefully you're all now seeing a PowerPoint. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, great. So I'll be giving a brief update on the accessibility work that we've been doing within Folio and within the SIG. Um, and so the topics that we'll go over is some of the assistive technology testing that we've worked on, the user experience testing, and then finally some resources. So to begin with a massive thank you, um, so I'll be honest, I've taken over the SIG starting in September. And so um, this is mostly the work that Debbie Hamrick has been working on. And then also um, Kalia Gambrell is our um, kind of um, ringleader in chief who keeps our work going uh, and works with the developers and the, the rest of the back end to get the stuff that we're learning from our testing into um, the, the backlog. So giant shout out to everyone who's working on this. Um, so when it comes to assistive technology testing, uh, one of our largest partners here is Mike Wilmson at the CU Boulder Ac Accessibility Lab. Um, and this has been a really nice partnership. Uh, Debbie was previously at the libraries at the um, University of um, Colorado University at Boulder. And so she was able to form this relationship. And Mike's been great that even though Debbie's now left the, uh, the libraries that she, um, that that partnership still remains. And so we'll continue to be able to do testing um, with their accessibility lab. So I'm going to pull open um, this report from 2019 um, so that uh, we can kind of see the types of things that we learn and what we test for. So going to stop share and then I'll reshare. Um, click on the share screen too. Okay, and so, um, so the we get um, a report, and uh, Kalia is very nice about like putting it all together in a very presentable way, so that we can uh, process what we've learned. So at the accessibility lab, um, they'll use participants who are quite familiar with assistive technology, and so for this particular um, test back in at the beginning of the year, they had a blind tester using JAWS, a blind tester using um, ND. NVDA, and so those are both screen reader technologies, a low vision tester with the magnification, and then a sighted test administrator using JAWS and NVDA. Uh, this particular test was looking at checking out and checking in items, looking at patrons and specific holdings, searching and refining search results, and editing due dates. Um, and so 
Mike will go ahead and do the test and then give us back the report. Um, so some of the things that we've learned were about the alert messaging was not being read by the screen reader. Um, I think that was one of the, the big changes that we wanted to address. Um, so how this will work is the SIG will get this report and then we'll kind of prioritize the different things that need to go into the backlog. Um, focus issues have been something that we've been working on um, with that as well. And so um, if you're familiar with Folio, sometimes a panel will pop up. And so moving the focus from where you did your search to the, your search results, that's kind of that focus change um, and trying to make sure that those are always clear. Um, and so these are the type of reports we get. These are the things that um, that we'll notice. And so I, one of the reasons I wanted to show this results was so that you can understand that we are doing testing in a lot of different areas with users who use assistive technology, and we're getting those things into the backlog and looking at them. Um, so in terms of next steps, this is how how it works is that uh, the Accessibility 6 will sh do the showstoppers. We'll discuss the findings with our developers. Um, and then meet with um, Philip, who will talk later about um, how to improve the, the user experience. Um, so we'll continue on having this relationship and um, hopefully we'll be, I believe there's more testing planned. Actually, I think we have a phone call um, this afternoon to talk with Mike about uh, keyboard navigation. Uh, so this, um, you know, we're pretty active and continually to try to, to look at these things. Um, so the next thing about assistive technology testing is Jane Stevens here at Texas A&M gave a demo to the product council on the use of JAWS within Folio. So one of the things that the SIG tries to do is raise the awareness of the issues. Um, and I think that was pretty illuminating for everyone about trying to, when you are able to um, um, experience the screen reader kind of talking at you about like what it says and does not say. Um, so that, um, and I think we're planning on trying to do more of these broader um, uh, accessibility awareness. So at the next WolfCon, I think we're going to try to do um, a session on uh, accessibility so that people can experience um, the different ways that we're trying to make Folio accessible. Uh, we are also doing power hours, and these are quick testing across multiple institutions when we're able to try to get uh, rapid feedback and reduce that time between testing and getting things changed. Uh, so that's always the goal is to try to, when you do test Testing is that you want to see action as a result of that testing. So um, the, the power hours are a way to do quick questions, um, again, across multiple institutions so that you can get that kind of wide audience and um, get that feedback back to the developers as quickly as possible. Um, so we were planning on doing one in September, but I think with the changeover of the SIG leadership, that will be pushed back a little bit. Um, so that's where we are with accessibility testing. Um, and then uh, one of the things that um, is super important is user experience testing. And so where people might feel like user experience and accessibility might not um, um, be matched up, but the, the truth of the matter is, is that good accessibility leads to good UX and good UX leads to good accessibility. Um, and so in May and June, uh, we worked on um, a project uh, led by uh, Kalia who focused on the layout options, and I think that's what Flip's going to talk about later, and the inventory app. Um, and then also in September and October, where we're still designing a new process, um, and we're going to be looking at the user app there. And so just as an example of how this how this kind of ties together is um, from that, that earlier test this year, is that when we looked at the scannability, um, improving the color contrast within the UI was favored by everyone. So better color contrast is an accessibility issue, but really fixing that issue or improving upon that issue um, uh, improve that experience for everyone. And so that's how these things are working together is that really when you're, when you're trying to work on design is that um, typically better user experience is going to be better accessibility and better accessibility is better user experience. Um, the last thing I want to point out is that there are all these cards going into JIRA for the backlog and so that the testing is going someplace that we are um, pushing these, these things forward and it's being incorporated within the development of Folio. Um, and then lastly, I'm highlighting some of the resources that have been developed um, as part of the SIG work and beyond. Um, one of the um, 
really important things to highlight. And I think, so one of the reasons I want to highlight these two is like they're, they're useful regardless of whether or not you're working on Folio. So these are things that can be applied to any of your, um, um, any project. So uh, product owner accessibility. So this document inside our wiki talks about why accessibility is important. Um, and going to that idea of integration within the, the Folio product development is that, you know, uh, accessibility is part of the um, um, acceptance criteria for, for product owners. Um, so this is a wonderful doc that talks about the importance of testing and the different types of testing. So keyboard testing, color contrast testing. Um, there's a lot of different uh, com compliance checker tools um, out there um, and user testing working with um, people. So there is one resource. Another resource um, that has been developed um, is the Folio um, UX guidelines. Um, and so these are within the Folio UX guidelines generally. Um, and so that you can, they give the, um, let's click on something. It will give you a checklist of the different things to look for um, and what, what, um, what criteria they're referencing within the WCAG. Um, so that's another great one. There's also um, within the wiki, the usability and accessibility evaluation resources. Uh, and this is a listing of all the different things that we've been working on as well, uh, kind of like a dashboard of the, the different testing and, and such, as well as um, documentation regarding what our approach is to, to testing. Um, and then lastly, a wonderful, um, usability testing toolkit. And again, this is applicable across the board that came out of Cornell. Um, and it goes through the different usability testing methods that, um, that you can choose from. So that is um, where we are at accessibility. Um, we're going to have our next meeting in October. Uh, we took a little bit hiatus over the summer um, as we switched leadership and also um, the summer. Um, so, uh, that I think is what I have. My PowerPoint restarted, so I, I know though that that was my last slide. <laughs> so um, uh, thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you, Beth. Um, perhaps we'll wait just a minute to see if we have any questions come in uh, through the through the chat. Um, Maybe I have a quick question for you. Um, what do you think is like the most um, pressing challenge for accessibility SIG coming up in the next few months? Oh boy, uh, that's a great question. Um, I think continually trying to get the institutions prepared for uh, going live in 2020. Um, one of the issues that I see that we need to work on is uh, the VPAT requirements that many of our institutions have. And so this is something that we're actively discussing and that um, whether or not we might need to contract out for with experts who write VPATs or if that's something that we can start doing internally, but um, starting to look at the VPAT requirements and making sure that Folio um, is meeting those requirements because I know that's going to be an issue for some institutions with procurement. So um, um, going ahead and trying to get ahead of that before the adoption um, um, is a big one. Um, and then I think just continually trying to do the usability testing and working with users and people who are who are using the systems. As more people are trying to use these on, uh, use Folio on the, how they have their um, um, computers customized, um, is going to highlight more issues that might need to address. I know one of the tests I did, I didn't really expect someone's browser to be zoomed in as much as it was. And so going back and looking at the um, um, magnification levels um, um, was a good example of how like, once you start seeing it in, in, you know, in the wilds, like what, what you need to do. So I think the more people adopting it, the more issues that will be resolved, but then also just procedurally, we need to have our VPAT um, ready to go so that um, it's easier for people to adopt. Okay, I think you have your work cut out for you. Um, I don't see any other questions, so uh, perhaps we'll move on to Philip. Philip, are you um, ready to take over? Yeah, can you folks hear me? Yes. Excellent. 
So let me just find my presentation and let's see if I can get this to work. You folks uh, see my screen now? Yes. Excellent. So, um, I was asked to talk a little bit about um, UX and Twilio and, and what's new. Um, and of course, all the time, a lot of things are new. Um, but I'd like to talk to you all a little bit about some of the visual changes you've probably been seeing in the system recently, like colors changing and, and uh, that sort of stuff. Um, more importantly though, I think those changes that people might have noticed are a reflection of changes that we've been making to um, the UX process. And um, I'm not sure what everyone who is present here right now is doing, uh, if and how you're involved with the Folio project. But um, I think um, if you are involved, then um, these process changes are quite relevant for everyone to understand. So a little bit about me. Um, my name is Philip. I'm the uh, UX lead on Folio. That means I'm trying to make sure that people can use Folio without reading a manual first and without attending a training seminar. That's sort of my goal. Um, I'm also running a small design company in Copenhagen that's focused on designing clean interfaces for complex data. What I'd like to talk to you about today is um, a little bit about the process, the UX process and how it's changed as the, as the project has grown. Um, and uh, in relation to that, the documentation is also changing. Um, and I'd like to talk about some of these styling updates. I'd like to show you some of the thoughts behind some of the changes um, and talk a little bit about more changes that might be coming. And then briefly just uh, say a few things about um, the communication channels in relation to UX and the Polio project. So first up are, is the process and the documentation. And so I'd like to, um, to talk about the changes that we're doing in Folio and that we have been doing over the past long period of time. Um, one of the things that we're changing is the way that we're updating the UX documentation. So that site that uh, Elizabeth just showed before uh, with the guidelines for UX, Currently, that's being updated. Um, that's being updated continuously. So whenever we, you know, find out something needs to be better, we update the guidelines so everyone can see what the official recommendation is for the project. Um, that's causing us a few um, a few challenges um, because. Um, we have some developers who need to keep up with all these changes we're doing. And we have a lot of product owners who are in charge of various product teams who need to implement these changes. And it's very hard to, to, to do that job and to talk to users and to talk to developers and to plan everything and also have the additional task of keeping track of what, the, you know, what those UX designers are changing on that UX platform. Um, you know, you'd have to go and check it all the time to see if things change. Uh, and even if we were to push out the changes through email or um, some sort of other way, uh, which, we, which we have tried to do on Slack and other places, it's still hard to keep up uh, for everyone. And so what we're going to be doing is changing the schedule or the frequency with which we update the documentation. So what we're planning on doing now is updating the documentation once every three months. So we'll be updating it uh, ongoingly um, on an ongoing basis internally in the platform UX team, and then we'll publish all of that sort of in bulk at the end of a, a quarter. 
Um, and so that means that it's only once a quarter that if you're in charge of the product, on, if you're a product owner on a, an app team or if you're a developer or a designer, it's only really once a quarter you have to sort of catch up on what's new. Um, what that allows us to do is to make sure that the UX guidelines that are published online are, um, you know, it's possible to keep, keep up with what's changing, but also make sure that they're always aligned with the actual code that's been developed. So let's say, for example, we want to change the color of the buttons in Folio. Um, then we can decide to make that change, and then we can tell everyone that you know now the buttons need to uh, be green. Uh, but that change is really something that needs to happen centrally in the in the button component that everyone is using, um, and so. It's no use for us to try to tell everyone how to, to update their apps if we can't also update the, these components that we've been telling people to use for the last couple of years. Um, and so I'm actually going to jump to this slide here. So, so I tried to visualize what that sort of would look like. Um, and um, it's very much, it's very similar to the process that we're running now. Um, so we have, if we imagine this being um, two different teams at the top, we have the platform UX UI team. So the, that's the team that I'm actively um, leading. Um, and uh, that's looking at, you know, when these changes that take place across the whole platform, uh, system-wide changes. Uh, when they change, that's the, that's the work of this team. And uh, defining the guidelines that everyone follows, uh, that's also uh, what we do in that team. Then we have different teams doing user management, circulation, uh, metadata management, ERM, um, ac um, purchasing and acquisition and all of that stuff. Um, so those are different areas. So I just called this area X because um, it could be any area. Uh, within each of these teams, we have different roles. We have users and subject matter experts or SMEs, UX designers, developers, and a product owner. And someone is asking on the chat, can we actually see the interface that's being described? Perhaps a pointer or link to the test server. So Denise um, is asking, Denise, can, which interface are you talking about? You're talking about the documentation interface or, or one of the examples I gave? Maybe you can clarify that in the chat. Thanks. And um, yeah, so this process um, involves all of these people. And what's, what we're hoping to be able to do is that in a given quarter, because the, the schedule is, um, stretches across a quarter, uh, we, of course, have dialogue and testing and feedback with end users, just like Elizabeth was mentioning. Um, and that and then is followed up by analyzing and designing something to address the issues and challenges that people have been finding out. Um, once we ha have a design, then the developers on this uh, platform team can start developing components and recipes, meaning uh, a description of multiple components and how they work together and the UX designers can start making the UX documentation. And this usually is a collaboration between the individual teams for different areas and this, the platform team. So that's why this is duplicated across um, both. So this is so far so good. This is pretty much what we've been doing for a long time. Uh, what we're going to try to do um, going forward, which is quite different, is that once we've gone through this cycle of getting feedback, designing something, documenting, and developing it. Um, we're going to do all of that first, and then someone is going to write a template user story uh, that is meant to be duplicated by each of the product owners for each of the teams in, uh, in Folio. Um, and um, so that could be, for example, let's say, um, 
we're trying to build a system in a way that we can make changes centrally, like the example I gave before with changing the color of button, we could actually do that without anyone else being involved. Uh, but it could be something where it requires all the app teams to make a small change or to update the code that they're using. And so even if it's something simple like that, you know, you need to go and swap out a, a piece of code, someone has to do that. And there are so many apps and so many teams right now in the project, uh, which is great, but it also means there's a lot of work in, in making an update like that if there isn't a, the infrastructure to make that happen. And so, the, so that's what we're trying to address with this new approach to implementing these system-wide changes, which is that we'll write a story. Uh, let's say um, the story is that an element has to be placed a different somewhere else in the layout. That's, that's something that you probably have to change in the code for each app. So we define this uh, design change, and then we write a user story explaining how and uh, how it should happen and, and um, what the details are and so on. And that template user story um, is then something that the product owners for each of the teams will be able to duplicate, and then the developers for each app team will be able to implement that. And um, as that is happening, uh, the stuff you see over here in the first quarter is then repeated again in this quarter. We start analyzing again, talking to users, creating documentation for new things, and then every quarter we have new guidelines, new template user stories, and so on. And this, of course, only relates to the system-wide UX changes. So in addition to this, each app team, if you're working as a developer, or PO, or designer on an app team, you know that there's lots of stuff that you that you're designing and developing in your team that's um, just relevant for the app that you're doing and not for the platform. Um, and so the reason we're trying to make these uh, ready to copy templates for people um, is that uh, this is an extra piece of work for everyone. And so we wanna make it as easy as possible. So um, that's the change we're gonna be making. So someone is asking on the chat, if uh, we can show the user interface of Romeo, and we definitely can, and I'll get to that in a, in a second. Um, I think that um, yes, let's jump to the styling stuff. So, as Elizabeth mentioned, there's been um, there are various uh, initiatives and efforts ongoingly. Um, or recurringly to um, make sure that we test what we're doing and talk to users and subject matter experts about the designs. Um, and some of those initiatives have already been mentioned. It it's, has to do with you know, ongoing dialogue between product owners, designers on one side and users and subject matter experts on the other. Uh, there's been a, a larger survey done uh, in the project recently and um, I think I actually have a, a link that describes some of the findings of that, so I'll just put that in the chat. It also shows a lot of, um, I have it here actually. It goes over, you know, what has, feedback has been gathered and then it shows some of the interface design changes that have uh, been made as a result of that. So if anyone feels like going into detail with that, they can go to the link that I'll share in the chat now. Uh, after awards. Um, so there's that document. Um, yeah, so there's a survey. Then we've been getting uh, feedback from um, from the accessibility lab, uh, like Elizabeth talked about. Uh, Chalmers in Sweden is uh, trying to get um, Folio up and running uh, live in their institutions. So they've been having a lot of feedback um, of what sort of, you know, the, the things that need to change for them to be able to use it. Um, and I can see I put survey in two times, but uh, that's, that's just one survey. Um, so these are the channels, and I um, I need to mention one thing, which is that um, these changes that we're making to the platform, they are um, they're not happening all that fast, you know compared to what they would in a much smaller project. But the reason that we're trying to 
um, or the reason that, that that it's happening in speed it is, is that we're trying to keep things consistent across all of the apps that are in the system. And like I just explained, the process um, required, there's a lot of logistics that need to be in place for these changes to be implemented smoothly uh, without uh, making it confusing to use the system. And so um, that is, um, that's a quite important point because I'm going to show you some interface stuff now. Uh, I actually think most of the stuff I'm going to show you now is in the grand scheme of things, not that revolutionary or, uh, I mean, they're significant for the things that they address, but in the grand scheme of things, looking at the full system, the examples I'm going to show you now are quite small. Uh, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we do that and, um, and the fact that we're going to make more changes. So anyway, um, and I think just like Elizabeth, um, it's, um, it's appropriate to give a, a big thanks to, uh, to Kalila, who's been working on um, optimizing the, the planning and development for, for all of this, because um, I don't know how it would be possible without uh, some people making sure that that works well. Um, Yes. So some of the things that we can look at are the top toolbar. So I don't know. Can you folks see this window I'm pulling up now, or do you just see? Um... We can see it. Okay. Excellent. Um, so the the one thing that's changed recently is um, this top toolbar in the system. Um, it used to be light, and now it's dark. So it used to be light gray, and now it's dark gray. And there have been some changes to the font sizes and so on. Um, the, the basis for doing this change is that we got some feedbacks from, um, from the survey and, and conversations and so on, saying that people found it hard to quickly grasp what app they were in in the system. And so let me pull up. Um, something like this. So before we, can, we made the change, the, the top bar looked more like this, you know, with a light background, um, a smaller text size over here, and the F that was selected was just this um, bar uh, shown above the app name that you had selected. Um, and so what we've done is change the background color, as you can see, and uh, we've changed the font size of the the current app over here so that it's very prominent and easy to spot. And we've changed the styling that shows which app is selected. And what we've also done is tone down these, um, these other labels and icons that you haven't selected currently um, so that they are uh, less visible than the one you've currently selected. So before it was like this, all of them were equally visible. Let me zoom in on that. And we've changed, um, changed it so that they're toned down. So, I mean, this is, uh, this is fine. And uh, it's, it's um, the same level of pretty as it was before. I think and I don't have a, an opinion on the aesthetics uh, of it other than I think it does look fine. Um, but the process by which we arrived at this, um, I'd like to just show you if that's okay, just to give people an understanding of what we've been doing. So we've been um, we've been sending out a bunch of um, we've been testing various um, prototypes. So the one we're looking at here was actually tested um, with a few different layouts. So this is this is one of them, the one that we've chosen to go forward with. Uh, then we have another one where we moved the the whole header to the, to the left, and then still have a search pane and a results pane. And then a third one where we have that, but we move the search pane into the header of the app here. All of these layouts can work perfectly well. And uh, it might be later on that we explore uh, some of these where things are aligned more along the x-axis. Um, but for a fast change um, and uh, an easy change, this seemed like um, something that worked for people, and it was definitely a lot clearer for people in which app they're in when they look at something like this. And so, um, let me open up. 
this one. So this is the layout we had before um, with um, the apps, all the apps over here, the app you're currently in over here, and then this thing to show that what you've selected. Um, so what we did was, uh, the, the challenge here was, can you make this, um, can you make it clear which app I'm in currently? Uh, that was, you know, the, uh, the goal of this design change. And so it wasn't because we felt like the styling was boring and old and unfashionable. That was the problem that people uh, stated having. And so we tried out a bunch of different uh, things, but some things that seem obvious to change would be make it more prominent. You know, the current app that you're in, make sure people can notice that. So we made the text size here bigger. Then we thought maybe we could, um, maybe we could highlight um, more clearly what app people are in. So we changed um, the layout from being a line up here to being something around the, the app that you've selected here. The problem with this is that the buttons in Folio before looked like this. So now it looks like we have a button along with some other stuff up here in the header. Um, and so, and also we had the problem that, um, that um, when we start doing this sort of stuff with big elements that are standing out in the header, it starts to compete with the content down here. So there's a lot of stuff going on on the screen. And so a way to change that is to make sure we enclose the header up here somehow. So we could do that in different ways. One way is to change the background color. That all of a sudden makes it extremely clear that this white area, that's one section, and the, the dark area is another section. Um, and the way that the interface looked before, all the texts were actually 100% visible 100% of the time. Um, that means that, um, you know, yeah, that means that you notice them all equally well. Of course, we have this element now, but another way to make it clear what app you're in is to turn down the, the, um, the contrast of these, the opacity. So we did that in addition to changing this layout. And now it still looks, it actually looks even more like a button we have up here because this is what the buttons look like. Um, and so what we did was also change the button layout um, in Folio to have, give them a different shape so that this doesn't get confused with a button. Um, and so now, and then we end up with something like what we have now. So I can open up the the interface that we actually have implemented um, just here. Of course, we have a lot more apps because I have a very big screen. Let me try and zoom in a bit so everyone can see. Um, so that leaves us with something like this, you know, a very prominent current app. And uh, right now I'm in an app that's not in the top menu here, but if I click on something up here, that makes it very clear where we are. And you can see that these other texts are, you know, light gray. Uh, because they're opaque and so are the, the icons. Um, so if you click around uh, in this interface, you'll, you'll notice that, um, you know, when you click on something here, it gets um, more opaque. So that's the process that, um, that leads to these changes that we've been doing. So this is one change that we did, you know, we changed some colors and it's not because we feel like it's, it looks cooler or something like that. It's a very practical and pragmatic approach. You know, we need people to know where they are and um, changing other things meant that it would be too confusing to have the, the header still be light. And so we made it dark and that brought about some, the need for some other changes and so on. Um, so, Kim Kester is asking in the, um, in the chat, if there's a limit to how many apps can be in the in the header up here. Right now, it's it's um, it's hard coded. What we would like to do in the longer term is to allow people simply to to drag this line here to choose how many apps they want to see in their header. Uh, but we we haven't uh, done that yet. So right now, it just looks at your screen width, and then it 
tries to estimate how many apps you can fit. Uh, if that makes sense. So, um, so that's one of the changes we made. Before I keep uh, jabbering, does anyone have any questions about this or talks they want to share? Uh, oh, um, how does it work? People can't speak, so so people have to write in the chat. Is that how it works? I take that as a, as a yes. Yes, they, they need to enter a question right. in the chat. Right. So feel free to ask questions in the chat if you want. Another thing that we've changed is uh, the styling of the, um, the table layouts. And um, that's simply to make it clearer, um, and make it easier to, um, to scan the, the table layouts. Um, and so we've added some lines vertically. We've, um, we've changed the background colors a bit so it's easier to see where the table starts and, and ends and so on. And we're going to continue to make a lot of these small changes. So one of the things we've also been changing is if you go to an app like users, for example, um, and you look at a record in that app, what you see is that the, um, the sort of the key here, first name, for example, is now bold and the content is, uh, is not bold. Before we had it the other way around, um, and we we did some different um, some different versions of a a styled uh, a restyled interface. So we had um, you know things where the and the the keys um, the field names I guess we can call them the field names are bold and the values are regular weight. And we have some where it's the other way around, and we have some with um, you know, different sorts of alignment, different uh, structure, um, more or less elements to create structure. And so we've run this past some, um, some subject matter experts to, um, to hear how, how clear these different interfaces are to them. And then based on that, we've made some, uh, some conclusions about where we need to take the design. So, what I'm showing you here, of course, isn't in the interface when you look at it now. But one small thing that came out of it is just, you know, let's uh, start with making these uh, field names bold and the field values uh, not so bold. Someone is asking in the chat, where do things stand regarding universal navigation features, breadcrumbs, tabs, and other elements that help an operator follow a trail without losing the original pathway? Um, so as far as I'm informed, uh, the the breadcrumbs in the folio um, system. Um, we've explored a while back various ways to do it. Um, I think that part of it is dependent on uh, on solving some underlying technical infrastructure. So the stuff that you see up here in the URL bar. So right now it says, you know, whatever domain you're on and then slash users slash view and then some ID. Um, and if I go um, to open the loans of this person, for example, then it opens the loans. Um, I think it might op actually be opening this loan screen here on top of the results and the preview and so on. Um, and so, the, the infrastructure, underlying infrastructure, technical infrastructure that, that makes the system understand that when I, in the URL bar up here, writes slash users, slash record X, slash loans, and so on, that's the same infrastructure that is going to be used to control the breadcrumbs. And so for those of you who are not, don't know what I'm talking about when I say breadcrumbs, um, various things have been, uh, discussed in the in the folio project in the past, and one of them is this notion that for a given app you might have um, a breadcrumb up here. Um, and so, for example, if you open up the profile of John Doe, and then you open up the loans page for him, and then you open up uh, a specific loan, um, then you would see where are where where am I right now? Um, and so, it's definitely something that people are. Uh, discussing and I think trying to address. Um, it seems that this underlying structure, uh, infrastructure that is 
uh, has to do with routing, they call it. I'm not a programmer, but what I've been told uh, is what sort of limiting us from just doing that uh, um, very quickly because uh, it relies on this bigger task of, of fixing the underlying structure. So Mark, uh, thanks for that question. I don't know if that uh, answers uh, your question. You asked about tabs as well. So um, that's also something that's been discussed. So the notion that, for example, within a given app, you could open up multiple records um, and have them appear here as different tabs. So you would have John Doe, Anna Doe, Peter Doe, um, and maybe for users that's less useful than, for example, if you're cataloging and you need to uh, have some things open. Right now, uh, and I think it's mostly because of the nature of these, the technology we're using with the web apps, uh, web-based technology, um, that's not a, a straightforward thing to do. Uh, it can be done, and I, I, don't, I won't say that it's never going to be done, but it's not some, something that's actively being explored right now. Um, simply just because um, so many other things seem more crucial to, um, to the groups that we're discussing all the functionalities with. I would say, I think that's generally true. Someone, you know, people are welcome to correct me if you feel differently, of course. That's my impression in terms of uh, priorities. It's not that it's not important, it's just that um, there are other things that are more urgent. So that's, uh, yeah. Um, one of the things that we've actually fixed um, also is um, when you see a table like this, it used to be that these uh, text in a table would sort of rather um, arbitrarily just wrap, around, wrap themselves. So even though there's lots of room here for an email address, uh, the email address would be split into on a screen like this. And there would be like extra space between the columns and so on. Um, and for a non-programmer like me, of course, it, it seems like a, um, like a no-brainer, or it seems like something that would just sort of come out of the box when you build something like this. Um, but the thing that um, makes this so um, not so straightforward is that these types of table views with the technology we're using is not um, very straightforward at all. Um, because um, what we want the system to be able to do is to change uh, the interface along with the size of the screen and the size of the panes and so on. That means that technically what we're seeing here is actually not a table, um, you know, under the hood. It's a series of boxes that gets that get laid out as a table. And so every time we want to sort a column or uh, chain, you know, define how wide a column is and so on. The system needs to calculate, it needs to sort of look at, well, how much content do we have in this, uh, in each of the cells here? And then uh, it needs to calculate, um, I think it's the, the third quartile we've used as sort of the, the goal that, you know, um, to set the width of these columns. Um, and so there's a lot of small things that are required to make this work. So the fact that we now have a, a much better rendering of these tables is going to make a really big difference for the, the usability of the system. It's of course not something that's debatable whether it should be like that, but it's just a lot of effort that's been put in by the developers to make sure that, that it works better. Um, and then another thing that we've changed is the, the iconography for the um, search and filter pane. And again, we did this series of small prototypes where you can, um, we would let users, um, uh, so I, I wasn't the one doing the testing, so I think either they've been using this or they've been uh, just reviewing it. I'm not 100% sure, but um, the, um, the thing that we've, we have used at least is a small prototype that allow you to close and open the search and filter pane out here, which of course you can do in the, the current system. And what we had before was a, a search icon here. And then when you uh, opened up um, the search and filter pane, the search icon would still be here and you click it again to close the search and filter pane. That uh, we got feedback that that was confusing to some people. Um, because they expected to go to a different page when the search icon was clicked, whether the search and filter pane was open or not. 
And so, uh, so I put together a bunch of different versions. So here we have a, an arrow, and then when you open it, you have an X to close the pane. We have another version that is a search icon that gets sort of toggled on and off, and when you click it, it stays in the same place, but it, um, it opens and closes the filter pane. We have one where the, the search icon is visible all the time, but there's also an X when you open this pane and so on and so forth. So different things with arrows, Xs, different types of icons, so different positions of icons. And with all of these different versions, the one we arrived at, um, I actually think we did one round where, everyone, where people tested this out and then we did another round with some tweaks of the most popular patterns and that led us to this one we're using here. So um, yeah, so that's why this has changed the, the way it has. So a lot of these things that, that change, if you see something in the interface change all of a sudden, um, it's not so much because we think it looks amazing. Um, it, of course, it needs to look good and fine. Uh, but the most important thing for us is that it's easy to use um, and that it's easy to quickly grasp where are you in the system and how do you get to where you need to go. That's sort of the underlying um, philosophy of a lot of these changes. And to make sure we can continue to do these changes, we're, like I mentioned, we're gonna be um, looking at how often we update the UX documentation and we're gonna update the UX documentation side itself that Elizabeth just, um, just um, showed. And so one of the things we're gonna be doing is um, adding various I think a library in our catalog, we call it other name forms for the content in our documentation. Um, so for example, we have various components and uh, UX patterns and so on that people can explore on the documentation site. Um, but um, people know all of these things by different names. So the thing that is called, technically is called upload files on our site. Some people might refer to that as attachment or media upload or file upload. And so what we're going to do is go through all of our content and add these different terms. So for example, something simple like uh, the field that we have here. I mean, some people might call it an input field, a text field, a search field, a filter input, you know. Um, and we want to make sure that it's easy to just go to this page, write whatever you think it's called, and then hopefully it should show up at the top. Um, and what we're also doing is trying to make it easier if you don't know what to search for, uh, but you know sort of what it relates to, to make it easy to browse by topic. So having this page where we have all the guidelines that have been, we spent, my colleague um, Stephanie spent a long time going through all the content and making sure that it's aligned with the, the developed code that we have now and also uh, adding some metadata to it so that we have all these different categories that, you know, some content is in multiple categories. Um, like we have one called forms uh, that then lists the different types of content components, uh, what, how to write your text for your interface and patterns. Um, and under each of these, we then have different pages that you can go to. So if you click any of these, it will take you to a page with, with details about um, the different things. And then, so for components, for example, we have, upload files, uh, a label, layout, search button, date picker. Um, these are all the things that you would use if you're building a form. And of course, this is um, not that exciting if you're just a user of Folio, but if you're a product owner who needs to figure out what the correct way to design something is according to the, the patterns we've defined, uh, this should hopefully be very helpful um, because it allows you to start from different um, sort of human readable terms that you can browse by or search by. Um, so, yeah, that's, um, that's some of the things we've changed. And Kimmy Kester is asking, can you give us the URL in chat for that site? And I can, and I will send it out to everyone as soon as it's ready. We're adding, uh, we're finishing it up now. So this is a real site I'm showing, but we need to, to add some more things and and uh, some more metadata before I think we should um, 
let everyone use it. So very soon, this is going to be updated, and it will be available as soon as we publish it on the, the regular documentation URL, uh, urx.polio.org. Um, so, um, yeah, that's some of the styling changes we've done. And I can see that, um, yeah, that's good. I thought, I mean, I was asked to give a general update on UX, so that's what I'm doing, talking about process, talking about documentation, talking about styling. Um, if you're new to the project or you have, you're not so involved, um, I just wanted to briefly mention the way that the communication seems to be happening now. Uh, and a year or two ago, the docu communication happened very much on the Discuss channel the forum for the project. Um, and there are still questions and, and uh, topics being raised in there, but it feels like to me that it's mostly very specific questions that um, sort of uh, either need a, a very specific answer, uh, but where it's not so urgent, or topics that are meant to spark dialogue and debate over a longer period of time without getting lost in the, in the in the um, array of messages on Slack, for example. But otherwise, I think the day-to-day -day dialogue seems to very much be becoming more active on, on the Slack channel. Um, so there are different groups for the various apps and topics where people are asking questions and pointing out bugs and all sorts of stuff. Um, so I'd encourage everyone to, to feel free to partake in that discussion. Um, then we have these weekly meetings or whatever interval the different groups have and, and um, of course the different email um, lists that are set up. Um, so yeah, I would say if you're just looking to have a sort of keep up with what's happening, I think Slack is probably the best way, place to um, keep an eye on. Um, yeah, so that's my update on on UX and Folio in general. Um, if you have any questions or advice or ideas in relation to any of this, you're very welcome to reach out to me on email or discuss or Slack or however you would like. Um, and um, I think that leaves us some time for questions too. So if anyone has any, have any questions or topics now that you'd like to discuss, please um, send them in the chat. Peter, does that sound uh, meaningful? Or sorry, Paul, I guess it's the convener. Uh, it sounds good. Uh, we would welcome any questions, so please enter them in chat if you have one. So I have a question for you, um, Philip. Um, so you've been working on the UX design for some time now in Folio. Right. Uh, are, are there some things that you now feel kind of most proud of or most uh, attached to? Uh, there is, but it's not anything that you see in the design. Um, the thing that I'm most attached to and have been uh, throughout the project is encouraging anyone who's building things in Folio to use these uh, central components, which I spent so long talking about in this meeting, um, because that enables us to do these changes uh, as we find, find out that things can be better, to make those changes centrally uh, without involving everyone um, and spending everyone's time on it. So for example, you, if you've been following the project and the prototypes or the, the demo platform, you will have noticed the you know, uh, the, the buttons changing their styling, the universal header changing its styling. The, um, yeah, and you'll be seeing a lot more of that sort of stuff happening um, in the future. So, so my pet peeve in the project is just making, encouraging people to, you know, use these central uh, building blocks that we're developing so that when we change those, the whole system can change for the better. Um, and I think we've done a pretty good job of, uh, you know, encouraging people to do that. So I think that's probably what I'm most proud of if I had to pick something. I don't know if that 
counts as a politician's answer, but um, it's an honest one, so. Yeah, it works for me, thank you. So I don't see any more questions coming in. So I guess we can just wrap this up. Um, so this concludes today's Folio Forum on the Folio User Experience Design and Accessibility. We've been live tweeting from the forum. For a short recap and links to resources, look for the Folio Forum hashtag on the Folio underscore LSB Twitter account. Thank you to the social media team from EBSCO for the live tweeting. You can continue the conversation using the hashtag and at the Folio discussion website, discuss.folio.org. The recording of today's forum will be posted on YouTube shortly. The next forum will be a Folio project roadmap update on October 23rd, and the announcements for registration and the like will be sent to the Folio newsletter. You can also find it at the events section of the folio.org homepage. Thanks very much to our speakers, Beth and Philip, and to everyone who joined us today. So thanks very much and we'll see you next time.